Hello, everyone. Welcome back to AAAS Publishing. And today we're going to continue this, the series on the topical corridors. And I'm very pleased to have uh, Judy Pfeiffer with us today. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the ISM corridor. Judy, mm -hmm. say hi and whatever you start. Okay, it's the ISM corridor and the local uh, universe. So I get the nearby galaxies as well. What defines uh, nearby? I'm not really sure. I, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure there's. Yeah, I'm sure there's some definition, but um, you know, I I just accept what comes my way. <laughs> yeah, we don't throw it out if it's 17 megaparsecs. That's, that's yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, I mean, it's it, it, usually the things that are um, have to do with the local galaxy um, are are things that. Uh, uh, you know that uh, have some relationship to the to what we do in the rest of the corridor, interstellar medium and and uh, similar topics. So things like star formation. Yep. Mm -hmm. feedback. Right, right, all of that, and supernovae, and and uh, um, sometimes uh, uh, aspects having to do with stars, but not stellar evolution, obviously unless it's talking about protostars, in which case I get that. How about chemistry? Do you, do you get all the... Um, I get a lot of chemistry, yeah. A lot of chemistry stuff, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, fortunately we have uh, an expert who can I can assign those papers to. <laughs> oh, well, let's mention that person by name, since uh, people may want to know. So who is, who is the... Daniel Seven. Daniel. Yes, and he, he, uh, um, he's, he works in laboratory astrophysics, but uh, he's very knowledgeable about a lot of the aspects of uh, uh, interstellar chemistry. Indeed. Uh, I think so that's great. papers went to Daniel at some point. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> uh, so, what yeah. journal does most of your stuff get published in? Is it, is it mainly uh, APJ, AJ, or do you have a split? What do you do? Mainly APJ, but uh, um, a few of the more observational papers appear in AJ, and uh, there's a con there are a considerable number that go into supplements. Yeah, okay. So. Um, yeah. I, sometimes, though not often, I deal with uh, um, instrumentation that might be used for some of these observations. Doesn't happen frequently, but uh, um, sometimes. It does, and it's a little hard to tell what corridor things actually belong in sometimes, uh, because some some of these uh, proposals or uh, proposed instruments are uh, they they might have a um, a background radiation component or something, you know that uh, that puts it in my my corridor. Yeah. Although obviously. Um, you know, the technical corridors get involved as well. Indeed. So as you look uh, at the papers that are, the manuscripts, I should say, uh, that are flowing in and have flowed out, um, hopefully accepted, but uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, what do you see as some of the really uh, cool science topics mm -hmm. that are hot these days? Well, um, many of the ALMA observations are pretty amazing. Um, uh, people are probing um, the inner chemistry in, in protostellar regions. Um, there's a lot of work uh, being done to try and uh, understand the role of magnetic fields in star formation and turbulence as well, and of course they're linked, but uh, um, observationally it's very hard to establish some of those links. And uh, uh, the ALMA has been very, very helpful. And then, of course, that bridges the magnetic field work that ALMA does, bridges to work that is done with, um, uh, at a much uh, larger spatial resolution. Uh, first of all, uh, possibly with, uh, you know, something like the JCMT or, or our telescopes of that sort. And then uh, even um, 
Planck and uh, the very large scale magnetic field structure because the, the picture the picture is quite interesting when you uh, start uh, threading between the uh, among the different spatial resolutions. Yeah. And it gets very interesting and it's actually fairly controversial some of the time when you get down to the smallest scales. I can't say that everybody totally agrees always with uh, one person's interpretation over another, but that of course is the point, just to put these things out there so that uh, um, yeah, yeah, we can look, we can look for, um, the, the various scientists can look for uh, ways of uh, uh, proving things one way or another. What is some of the controversies uh, where a consensus hasn't been reached? Is it the magnitude of the magnetic fields? Is it directionality or what are, what are some? More of the, the modeling of it, the cause of the particular okay. magnetic field directions that are seen. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of good work being done. And uh, let's see, uh, I, those are the, the most interesting, I think, but, but uh, I'm not trying to say that a lot of the other fields don't prove to be interesting as well. Um, for example, um, there are interesting papers uh, uh, talking about our own galactic center region um, where uh, there are models that try to explain a, a, a number of observations across the spectrum um, um, for, and, and uh, uh, I mean for example there has been some attention paid to the possibility uh, within the galactic center region of an intermediate mass black hole um, there, there is uh, some as, as, a, as a binary companion to the main one. No, it's just a different region, um, oh. close by, oh. relatively close by. Multiple, multiple black holes in the central regions. Yeah, well, I, I think the most recent consensus is that it isn't a black hole, but you know, uh, for a while that was what was being discussed. So, so that was sort of interesting too. Yeah. I, I find the papers very interesting. Um, I, you know, I find that uh, the number of topics that uh, the journals cover these days is so large that uh, being a, a scientific editor um, <laughs> gives you the opportunity to read things that you might not read otherwise. And uh, it, so it provides a, an education that, that, uh, that is certainly needed in my case. <laughs> I, I will second that. I mean, um... One of the primary reasons why I got into this game was to keep up my reading habits. And certainly mm -hmm. as an editor, boy, you get to read all kinds of stuff. Right, right. Um, I, 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 do, uh, I do enjoy it. I've been doing this for a very long time now. I don't how even know how long. How long have you been a scientific editor? Pardon me? How long have you been a scientific editor? I can't remember, really. I think. <laughs> Love it. It was... Uh, <laughs> it was um, more I was with Rob, Ken with Rob Kennicott as a, a scientific editor for two or three years before um, he resigned and Ethan Vishniak took over as the lead editor, as the, um, you know, editor-in-chief, rather. Okay. So at least a decade. Oh, more than that, yeah. Ethan, Ethan was a scientific editor, actually, um, uh, under Rob Kennicott as well. Uh-huh. Cool. And that was in that, that was in the days of the University of Chicago Press. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Which is a long time ago. Yes. And then there was the the foray into um, the uh, uh, the the Bristol connection, <laughs> uh -huh. and then and now um, we've been we've been with uh, EJP for quite some time now. Yeah, yeah. It's, and and it's it's been quite successful. Yeah, I've seen a number of number of changes. I used to walk. I used to be at uh, Chicago, and I used to I would walk over to the press offices on occasion to mm -hmm. deal with one thing or another. Um, yeah, I've been through some well, changes. Well, things things were not uh, uh, over the internet in those days either. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, I mean, that's where I fell in love with the journals, actually. It was, uh, that was, you know, 
ADS was just starting up. You still had to go to the paper. Um, yep. So there was a certain joy in going to the library and tracking a thread through the literature of um, stacking up. Right, right. AJs and AJs as you track some thread through. So. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it, this is a very long time ago, but when I was uh, still uh, an undergraduate, um, Helen Sawyer Hogg at the University of Toronto mm -hmm. hired me for as a summer assistant. Oh. And uh, she was working on her globular cluster catalog. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had library work to do. But she said to me, don't feel that you just can't read anything you feel like reading uh, while you're in the library. And so, and she didn't, she didn't in any way, you know, make it difficult for me. And it's what really got me uh, convinced that that was the direction I wanted to go in. Cool. Yeah. I understand uh, Ethan took some classes from you as an undergraduate. That's right. He did. He was an amazing student, but yes, he did. Oh. Yeah. Did he have the same freedom to investigate all kinds of stuff? <laughs> well, well, uh, you know, when I would give a problem set, everybody else would struggle through using whatever the standard methods were for that particular problem. And uh, Ethan would invent, invent something totally different and uh, very concise. And uh, he would get his done very quickly in comparison with his colleagues. Uh, you know, uh, I think he was a he was a step above some of the others in the class. And um, his uh, his wife um, was Eileen was also a student and oh, I didn't know that <laughs> yeah and Eileen was she wasn't a student of mine but ah. she um, she worked um, in the physics of music lab um, with uh, um, Bob Knox who was the professor of that that initiated the lab I took over the lab from him and so I was aware of the things that Eileen had done while she was there. And uh, I do recall one day um, when Eileen and Ethan were looking for uh, information on graduate work. Again, this is pre-internet days. Um, I, I referred them to the Cornell uh, Graduate School uh, office because they had a lot of information there when I was a graduate student. And uh, so they, I believe they took, took off down to Cornell which is not that far from Rochester. It's a you know couple of hours to get there, and and uh, found out the information they needed to plot their graduate school careers. So so there's connections there that are interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, we live in a we live in a fairly small world in a in astronomy. I think. Tight knit community overall globally. I think. I think so. And uh, it's, for example, when I go to spy meetings, the, the Society for, um, what is it? Uh, Photonics SPIE. and yeah, Industrial Engineers. Um, yep. There are so many people there. And while the astronomy, the, the winter astronomy meeting is very, very large, um, and uh, you are not likely to see everybody you know who's there because it's so large. The spy meetings are totally, they're, they're a factor of three to five larger, and they are really difficult in that sense. Wow, cool. Yeah. So I'm glad that we're smaller. Let me ask something else. I mean, um, typically lead editors um, are not just paper pushers and all of that, they do have uh, lives active, inside. active research programs. So what, right. are you, what are you looking at research-wise these days? Yeah, well, my group um, uh, works on the development of, of uh, infrared detector arrays that can be passively cooled for various experiments. Um, I, I'm not saying we're not interested in the science and we actually do the science, but mm -hmm. right at, at the moment we're working almost totally on the, on the detector array development. We, we have developed um, uh, with, uh, with an industrial colleague, of course, in this case, Teledyne, um, okay. uh, uh, detector arrays that are sensitive at 10 to 15 microns. Um, well, actually they're sensitive from five to 10 or five to 15 microns that can be passively cooled. 
and that allows a much less expensive mission. Um, the the sure. reason we got into that game is that um, our group was responsible for the the uh, the 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 two arrays in the IRAC experiment, the infrared array camera sp experiment on Spitzer uh, mm -hmm. that went out to five microns. And uh, um, those were the only detectors that remained sensitive once the cryogen ran out and the focal plane uh, re-equilibriated to about 26 or 27 Kelvin, um, you know, balancing the thermal output against the, uh, the um, radiation from space right. um, and and uh, um, a lot of work has be, been done I mean the Spitzer ran out of, of uh, cryogen in 2009 mm -hmm. and uh, it was just turned off this year on January the 30th not because we could not do any further work um, but uh, the spacecraft was moving farther and farther away from the earth in an earth following orbit around the Sun and uh, telemetry was getting more difficult mm. uh, and the packets had to be uh, you know uh, compacted more etc um, mm. and and uh, uh, but the fact that we could we got we could get the data uh, the fact it lasted as long as it did even though there were only two wavelength cameras still working um, uh, was amazing in fact Dave Trilling said um, that that he made the most amusing comment at the Spitzer Legacy Conference, where he said uh, that the benefits of uh, two wavelength spectrometry uh, have been vastly underestimated, <laughs> 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 uh. which is cute. Um, but but there had, in the period um, in the post cryogen period, some of the most interesting science has been achieved. Um, for example, uh, the discovery of some of the extra planets, uh, exoplanets in, um, I can't even think of the name of the system right now. Can you? The one that has seven, seven exoplanets. Oh, um, um ah, to my yeah, I know. Um, ah, Trappist? Yes, Trappist. Thank mm -hmm. you. And, and I mean, that was very interesting. The other interesting thing that they have done along with uh, an enormous input from the from IPAC, uh, the, the people who have uh, developed algorithms to accommodate uh, Spitzer, among other things, they were able to uh, remove systematics brilliantly, um, so that uh, in fact uh, they can uh, that work could be done on uh, uh, some characterization of exoplanets mm -hmm. in the in the post cryogenic era. Spitzer. So that we realized that a lot of work could be done if you could have um, a passably cooled experiment in space, but you could have longer wavelengths as well as the shorter. Shorter, because for example, all of the classification of um, the the young stellar objects in the various phases of its evolution were done by using. Um, a, a, 3, 3.6, 4.5, uh, 5.8, and 8 micron data. Mm -hmm. And so that, that those longer wavelength data could not be obtained with Spitzer because uh, 6 degree Kelvin temperature was required for the, the ones that they had there. But had we the right detectors, had we uh, had uh, detector arrays that could work passively like at 26 or 7 Kelvin, then we could have been able to continue to classify objects um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in young stellar ob objects. And that was something that, uh, you know, I worked on uh, when Spitzer did have all of those four wavelengths available. And 24 microns was great as well. Well, so we started working on the project to develop, um, to develop these uh, uh, devices. They were terrible initially, and we didn't have very much money. It was hard to convince NASA um, of the utility of this project. But these, uh, were, uh, these were uh, uh, indium, were, indium antimony? Well, no, uh, indium antimonide is what we used for the five micron devices. Okay. Mercad telluride is used um, for a, a variety of, of, uh, tel of, um, of wavelengths because you can vary uh, the mercury to cadmium, mercury and cadmium ratio 
um, and change the wavelength. Wavelength, yes. Yeah. And so, um, however, there are problems as you increase the mercury uh, content. Um, the, the array becomes softer. It's uh, um, definitely more prone to defects. And those defects end up as dark current. <laughs> and so um, we, had a, we struggled mightily initially. But uh, we started to make a lot of progress. And once we started to make uh, pretty good progress, um, Amy Meinzer, who was then at JPL, uh, said, I want those arrays for a proposal I'm putting in, which she called then NeoCam. Well, we're yeah. still working on the, the, uh, what NeoCam has become. In fact, it's still called NeoCam until I think June or something or other this year. Uh, but then it will become uh, Neo Surveillance Mission for the mission and Neo Surveyor for the telescope um, because uh, NASA has decided that it's a directed mission rather mm -hmm. than um, okay. than uh, a PI led mission. PI -led. Yeah. yeah, and so um, and that that was probably a good choice because um, you know a survey mission for for near Earth objects, which is what this is all about. Mm -hmm. um, is is hardly um, the same thing as a detailed scientific investigation of an asteroid, um, which is what a planetary uh, scientist might be interested in. Um, and survey missions typically have become uh, directed missions because they serve a larger community than just one. So that's what we're doing. It looks pretty promising. Um, despite the fact it'll probably be a continuing resolution again this year. Um, <laughs> right, is there, a, is there a, uh, a tentative launch date or first light date? Um, well, we're talking 2025 at the moment, but uh, I don't know um, whether that's, I, I've got to say Spitzer, the Spitzer program that we started, um, I, I think we wrote the proposal in 1983 and it got we Iraq was selected in eighty four and it was launched in two thousand and three. Right. Wow. So, so uh, things at NASA um, have a, a way of yeah. You know. In fact, when the first Hubble was being proposed, I proposed an Insby camera then, <laughs> and wow. that was before we had even uh, uh, our very first Insby camera, which was in the. I think it was the late seventies or early eighties. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I got a great idea. When that mission finally flies, you should encourage all those people to um, publish their science and instrumentation work in the double AS journals. Yes. Well, I will. They make for great special issues. And, yeah. And we now have um, the planetary uh, science journal as well, uh, which we did not have before. Yeah, Faith, uh, Faith Velos uh, is heading that up, and we're going to be chatting with uh, Faith next Friday, actually. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. So, so anyway, that's probably enough about me. Um, that's, that's what my life has become. It's not what I would have imagined back when I was uh, a graduate student, but um, even then I was working on infrared rocket astronomy, and uh, in those days making single pixel detectors by hand to fly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, Judy, I want to thank you so much for your time uh, today. Pleasure. Uh, and uh, of course, we're we're living in a little different era today, so uh, stay yes, safe, stay healthy, please. Yes, yes, I I certainly hope to. You you the same. Okay. Right. All right, everyone. That'll wrap it up for today. And okay. We'll see you on the next one. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.